Welcome to the Lend Academy podcast, episode number 55. This is your host, Peter Renton, founder of Lend Academy. So here in our second episode for 2016, I am delighted to welcome the CEO of On Deck Capital, Noah Breslow, onto the show. And we had Noah Breslow on about 18 months ago, wanted to get him back on, obviously talk about his tenure as a public company CEO, just find out how that's gone, talk about a lot of the partnerships. We all know about the Chase uh, On Deck partnership. We delve into that in some depth. And some of the other partnerships that On Deck have penned recently, they've got a lot going on. And we also, you know, we'll talk about their growing suite of loan products, talk about the investor side of their business and, and also international expansion where they're focused on. There's all that and much more. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome back to the podcast, Noah. Thanks so much, Peter. Really appreciate uh, being here. Okay. So, you know, I want to get started. Here we are at the start of a, a new year and, you know, you've been a public company CEO for the last year and a bit. So I want to just check in and see how, how you feel like things have been going and, uh, and maybe what has surprised you most about, about running a, a public company. Yeah, things have been going great. I mean, uh, 2015 was an amazing year for the company, and and, uh, and I do think going public at the very end of 2014 was an important setup process that we did for the year we had in 2015. You know, if we look at why we went public in the first place, you know, there were a number of sort of reasons to it. Uh, one was around brand. One was really around sort of reputation and the vetting of the company and uh, the sort of um, you know professional grade uh, nature of that public process, if you will. And obviously, the capital side, uh, you know, is is very important as well, making sure the business is well capitalized for the future. So, you know, if I look at all the things that happened to us in 2015, you know, many of the things we did, for example, we we started to have folks like Bank of America and SunTrust fund our loans. We we signed a very big deal with J.P. Morgan at the end of the year. You know, those things, if I think about it, you know, going public really drove uh, those outcomes. In terms of the surprises, you know, I think it did surprise me a little bit how much time it takes to run a public company. Um, you know, certainly I find you know, a number of different demands on my time that are different than before. And uh, you know, and I think the other thing that surprises me a little bit is simply just the amount of noise that comes out, you know, around the company. People who understand the story well, but conversely, people who may not understand the story as well. And just sort of handling some of that noise um, has been a learning experience. But on the flip side, you know, we're very excited about the long-term uh, trajectory of where we're going. Right, right. Yeah, that sounds good. So you've you've recently done you know, some expansion to your product line. So I want you know, I want you to take us through today, like you're sort of the whole suite of products, uh, loan products that you offer. Can you just uh, can you take us through that so we're all up to date? Absolutely. You know, we are really focused on providing a complete financing solution to our customers. Uh, small business owners require capital for a variety of different reasons at every stage of their business's life cycle. And we want OnDeck to really be their first choice, uh, you know, when they are looking for capital. And so if you look at our product offerings today, you know, historically, we have a short-term loan product, you know, up to 12 months. That was kind of OnDeck's bread and butter, really the product we pioneered, you know, now nearly, uh, you know, eight years ago. We also now have longer-term loans. We actually go out to $500,000 over term as long as three years. Um, that's a relatively new offering for us, but we felt very good about our longer term loan performance. Our prior limits had been 250000 and two years, and that portfolio is performing very well. And we also have a line of credit product, which is a product maybe many people don't know about or associate with the company as much. Uh, it is a newer product. It's only about two years old now. But one of the things we did in 2015 is we actually raised the credit limit on that product to $100,000. It's very convenient. It's like having the, the credit card without the plastic. You can draw without any penalty as, as cash. You can draw from a mobile app uh, that we have for iOS and, and Android. And so that's really the day-to-day -day working capital solution uh, for our customers. So between the line of credit, um, the shorter-term loans, and the longer term loans, we now think we have a really, really nice uh, breadth of offerings uh, for our customers. So can you break us down in any kind of way of, as far as how things, I mean, obviously, you know, the larger term, larger loans are going to have, you know, the mere fact that they're large means they're, a large, they're going to be a big percentage of your volume. But can you break us down into how that, how the product suite, you know, is spread? 
Uh, sure. I mean, I can do it uh, a little bit on maybe loan volume as a percentage of our overall uh, loan book, uh, so to speak. Mm-hmm. I think if you look at the third quarter uh, public numbers, the line of credit portfolio was about 8 to 9% of our, our outstandings or our loans under management, if you will. Uh, so that gives you a sense of the relative size there. It is a newer product for us. We're very conservative as we roll out new products want to really incubate them, understand the credit dynamics before we grow them. And then on the longer term side, um, we actually don't break out our, our outstandings by loan size, but it, it, the dynamic is exactly as you say, Peter, where you know our, our smaller loans are generally shorter term, which means they come off the books a little bit more quickly. Our larger loans are a little bit longer term in general. They stay on the books for longer. And so what that means is over time, um, the percentage of our outstandings that are slightly larger loans are, are going to go up. So so we will see that dynamic both in terms of the duration of those those loans. The, the term in our balance sheet uh, will come up a little bit uh, over the next you know couple of years as those larger loans that are longer uh, play a bigger part of the overall dynamic. And you will see kind of the average loan size continue to trend up as it has really for the last uh, eight years. Right, right. Okay. So I want to talk about partnerships and in particular, let's, uh, you know, everyone's been talking about this, uh, the Chase partnership that you announced a, a couple of months ago. So firstly, let's, what can you share a little bit about sort of the, how this partnership came about and whether, you know, and just a little bit of the, you know, the sort of the timeline of sort of talking with Chase. I imagine this was not something that happened over, a, you know, even a two or three month period over. A, can you just explain how, how it all kind of came to fruition? Sure, uh, happy to. You're exactly right in that you know a partnership with a major bank like Chase does not come about over over two or three months. Um, we've actually been working with Chase uh, really for about a year at this point on building out this program. And so, if you back up even before that, um, really it was the middle of 2014 where we started to have some discussions with the Chase team. I think the Chase team at that time had had an offsite or some kind of strategic meeting where they had decided that really the smaller dollar, kind of the sub you know five hundred thousand dollar loans to small business was a pain point for them in terms of the process, in terms of the efficiency. And, you know, they had a number of discussions about what options were available uh, to them. You know, around the same time, we were preparing to go public and we had had conversations with JP Morgan, who was one of the book runners on our IPO. And and sort of, you know, as, as those two processes kind of ran, it created an opportunity um, for us to talk to Chase about solving this problem uh, with them and, and for them, for these their small business customers. So that was really the genesis. Those discussions kind of snowballed. And really, by the beginning of 2015, we were working in earnest, you know, towards uh, building out the solution that we will launch in 2016. Okay, so it, it so it hasn't launched yet. Is that true? Correct. Yeah. So the announcement before the holidays um, came a little bit earlier than we expected. <laughs> um, uh, there were some comments made at a, in a public forum, and we decided rather than let the news sort of spiral and speculate about who uh, Chase's partner was on this endeavor, right. it was better to own the message and and, and put that message out uh, kind of on the same day. Um, and we were happy to do that. We had already gone very far down the path with them at, over the course of a year, so it wasn't like it was a, a brand new uh, effort for us at that point. But as we said. Um, um, around uh, that time, we we haven't set a launch date or, or publicly announced a launch date. We have a very concrete plan internally, obviously. But you know, we're optimistic. It's not like this is a pie in the sky process for us. We're we're very much uh, heads down implementing at this point, and uh, we're excited. We think we can do uh, you know a very nice you know product for their customers uh, and and get that live in 2016. So, and just just to give just to get into a little bit of the nuts and bolts, this mm-hmm. is this is going to be a Chase product, or what you are going to be providing is the underwriting engine. So you will tell you tell Chase, obviously, one whether or not it's uh, this person's a, a good credit risk, and and then do you do you tell them the interest rate? I mean, what how is it going to work exactly? Yeah, so it's really the entire small business process, you know, for for sort of approving someone for a loan, you know, the originating that loan online, checking out with the loan, and then actually servicing the loans as well. So, uh, you know, the the model here is, you know, imagine you're a small business owner that has a Chase checking account. You might log into that checking account, you know, once a month or twice a month to check on your uh, your balances. And when you do that, you might see based on your your track record with Chase and based on the on deck kind of data and scoring capabilities, you might even see a pre-qualified or pre-approved offer right there in the portal. Okay. Um, with several mouse clicks, you'd be able to navigate through and, and see your loan terms and then check out online uh, with that loan. That's all on deck uh, technology. And then, um, and then it's really that simple. And then your loan is funded either same day or next day and you're off to the races. Um, so, so, that, so that's the product we're building. So the customer will stay on chase.com. They'll never actually go. It'll be, it'll be, it'll, it will be invisible to the chase customer. 
Yeah, it'll be seamless to the Chase customer. So so it's Chase's brand in the sense that so they, the customer won't necessarily know it's on deck. Um, but at the same time, you know, let's say the customer is checking out a you know a, a fifty five thousand dollar loan and they have a question and they want to talk to someone about that loan. Um, they'll be calling up uh, someone from on deck uh, who will then work with them to understand that product. Um, but we will be sort of serving Chase in that in that relationship. Right. Gotcha. Okay, so can you give us some ideas of where on the credit spectrum in the loan term, you know, the suite of products that you offer, that where this is going to sit? So we haven't actually disclosed uh, those exact details uh, yet. And what we have said is that the pricing on these loans will be very consistent with uh, bank-like or credit card-like pricing. So obviously, uh, you know, Ondex historical pricing has been higher uh, than traditional bank pricing. So these loans will be very much in, in Chase's sweet spot. And I think, you know, from a loan size point of view, as I mentioned, the focus is on smaller dollar loans. So I wouldn't expect any $2 million loans to be originated, you know, through this process anytime right. soon. Um, but the exact parameters, exact loan terms we haven't released yet, and, and we will obviously as the program uh, gets closer to launch. So, why do you think? I mean, Chase. I mean, they. You know, I know they haven't released their 2015 numbers, but they made like 20 plus billion dollars in net profit in 2014. You know, they have incredible resources. Why do you think they decided to go with you guys and not do this themselves? I think any bank who is looking to get into the online lending space has this fundamental uh, kind of build, buy, or partner choice. And at this point, you know, I think if you look at marketplace lenders and, you know, on deck, obviously in our field, but, you know, folks like uh, Lending Club or Prosper in the, in, in the consumer loan space and, and others in, in different asset classes, there is a head start element and a level of investment in these platforms that even if um, you have $20 billion in net profit, you know, it's hard for you to deploy that money quickly. Uh, you have to build a new team and technology platform from scratch in many cases. And so there's a time to market element. And I think there's a risk element that's important. And and, and on deck, you know, we, we only focus on one thing. We want to be the best small business lender in the world. And Chase is selling hundreds of different products. And, um, and you know, this, this particular, you know, category of customer may not be in their top 10, uh, you know, priorities. So I think for them, you know, they wanted a solution here. They wanted to be in market quickly. They wanted to work with the market leader and market leading technology. And I think for all those reasons, uh, we were a clear option for them. Right, right. Okay. And so, you know, you, this is not obviously the only bank partnership you, you, you have. You know, it's, it seems like it's going to be one of the deepest partnerships that you've had at least today. The deepest, yes, I think that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you, you have a partnership with BBVA. Mm -hmm. um, so how is it different and what, what is the BBVA partnership like? Yeah, so the BBVA partnership is is an excellent partnership for us and, and very consistent to a number of other partners that we work with, both banks and non-banks, but it is more of a referral relationship. So the way that that um, arrangement works is we do use some of BBVA's data to pre-qualify uh, customers who would be great fits for, for the on-deck product. We have a certain sort of set of on-deck products available to those customers, but the, the branding and the originations and servicing are all done under the on-deck brand. So the initial marketing might be co-branded, but then it's a straight referral to OnDeck, and OnDeck pays BBVA a referral fee you know, for, uh, for sending us that customer. And so that referral model, we think, is a great way for many folks to get started. I think in the case of Chase, they really wanted to go all the way to the what I would call the end state of, mm -hmm. of what one of these bank partnerships could look like. But, uh, but for many banks, that may be too far too fast. And I think with BBVA, we're optimistic that now that this referral relationship has been working really well for the last uh, couple of years, um, you know, we have an opportunity to deepen the integration over time. But I think different banks will move at different uh, speeds as they look at getting into the space. Right. And then you've also got, I mean, you're also working with, with institutions that are not banks like uh, Intuit. You talked about mm -hmm. that on your third quarter earnings call that I just mm -hmm. listened to last week. So... So the Intuit relationship, and you referred to it as on deck as a service, which seems kind of like the Chase relationship. Mm -hmm. um, what what are you doing with the? And obviously, Intuit has this massive number of small businesses that are probably right up your in your sweet spot. Many of them, I imagine, with uh, in QuickBooks. So how how does that relationship work? Yeah, it is very similar in many respects to the Chase relationship. So part of our strategy really is to build deep integrations uh, with our strategic partners, uh, especially partners that have millions of small business customers, partners that have extensive data on those customers. That's how we think we build the most differentiated customer experience, the most efficient pipeline, because you can do so much work on the front end to pre-qualify who's a good fit for the product. You don't have a lot of sad customers who get who get declined in the process. And that's really important for all of these folks because ultimately their brand is, is at play 
play here. So what Intuit identified is, you know, we had been working with them for a couple of years on their QuickBooks financing platform, but, uh, you know, and that had been going very well. And we're, we're the um, leading uh, lender on that platform, but it's a multi-lender platform. Mm -hmm. And so Intuit had said, you know, there's a set of customers we're serving with QuickBooks financing. There's another set who aren't really attracted to the offers on QuickBooks financing. They may be a little bit more passive seekers. We need something that's probably up market, lower price, uh, more flexible. And they ultimately looked at a number of companies to provide that solution. They chose us. And we've built a very nice integration now where, again, you really don't have to leave you know, the Intuit environment. Um, you can be pre-qualified. It's called the Intuit QuickBooks line of credit powered by on deck. It's 8 to 20% annualized interest rate uh, line of credit product. And, uh, and so it's basically co-branded. And actually, on deck and Intuit are co-funding those lines of credit as well. So we have a $100 million fund set up to uh, to to uh, to back up that production, so so that's why we call it kind of on deck as a service. Because again, there's APIs now that have been implemented between the companies. We're using similar technologies with Chase, and we think that's the beginning of what hopefully over time turns into you know a number of important bank relationships as well as important non bank relationships where we use these APIs to have a really integrated customer experience. You know, based on on the data uh, that these partners have as well as the on deck score. Right. Okay, that makes sense. So with that one, you're a bit more. Your, your your brand is part of the whole. That's correct. Yeah, we're like that. the sub brand in that in that relationship. So it's a yeah. powered by on deck. Okay, so I just want to talk about your customer base a little bit. You talk about how your your typical customer. You you said that over the over eleven quarters takes out three loans. And are these? I mean, obviously, I mean, are these? I presume this is sort of relatively short term loans. Are you seeing the, the like? When you're building your on-deck score, obviously, you know, you're building it for any kind of business, but you obviously have much more rich data on your existing business because you know how they you know how much, how, how they're paying. So do they, you know, do they get a cheaper rate? I mean, what, just talk us through again, your small business customers, what their, what kind of loans they're going after uh, and when they come back and, and take out another loan. Absolutely. So, you know, our typical customer um, is a is a is a mature. They've been in business on average seven years. Uh, established, a sizable small business. Uh, average revenues of around six hundred thousand dollars. And so, what we've found is that um, customers who take multiple loans with us, um, there's a positive selection effect there. Um, we are selective when we look at um, a renewal loan application. So it's not like you're automatically approved if you took a loan with us in the past. We actually have better data the second time around because, sure. as you noted, you know, we have the repayment behavior. We also can compare the business business as it looks on the second loan application to the first. And so what we've done with the on-deck score is now underneath the hood, there's a renewal sub-model in that on-deck score that, that takes that specific data and, and makes a higher quality decision with it. And so what that allows us to do is a few things. So renewal customers for us um, not only get lo- lower pricing, and we do have loyalty benefits that are even independent of the risk that we pass on to these customers, but they also can get you know higher offer quality, which we would define as longer term options, as well as higher loan amounts. So it's really, it's kind of all three of those dimensions. It, it's pricing, term, and loan amount all typically improve for renewal customers because we have built out our scoring now to take advantage of that data. So these are typically, that they'll come to you after they've paid off their loan or do you, do you ever do refis of existing loans? We do both. So you sometimes have a model, uh, you know, where folks have been 100% paid down on that first loan and they, they go away for a while, they come back, they have another episodic kind of project in their business. You've got a number of other folks who, you know, they buy inventory every six months and they basically refi their loans, you know, when they're 70 or 80% paid down. For us, the cutoff is around 50%. So you need to pay down your loan to 50% and then you're eligible to apply, uh, you know, for another loan. And then we roll the original balance uh, into uh, the new loan, forgiving all interest on obviously the first loan. So, um, so that's sort of the two dynamics we see, and we see both in substantial uh, fractions in our portfolio. Right, right. Okay. So I want to talk about the, the Small Business Borrowers Bill of Rights. It's been brought up many times on, on, in recent episodes of the podcast, including it was just the last episode with, uh, with Renault from Lending Club. You have not signed on to that, and I just want to—I want to find out why. Is there, are there some pieces of that that you guys don't like, or, is, or what's the reason? Yeah, so I think we 
felt strongly as one of the leaders in the space that any industry standard would, you know, ideally include on deck's perspective or point of view. And so, um, you know, sadly, we were not asked to participate in the drafting of, of the document. Um, so we've actually had an on deck core principles document on our website well before the BBOR uh, was, was put together. But, you know, more importantly than that, I think if you look at the actual principles and the way the document's written, there's a clear bias towards longer term loans mm -hmm. um, in, in the document. And so, what we feel, um, having reviewed it, is is that, and also having loaned, you know, over three billion dollars over the course of eight years, is that if you ignore the potential of shorter term lending to businesses, you're going to wind up leaving a lot of businesses out in the cold. We don't think a three year product is appropriate for many types of small businesses out there. But if you can't get access to a long term loan, we don't think that means you shouldn't get a loan at all. So what we'd love to see either in the BBOR or some other industry standard that that you might see developing over the next year is a broader perspective on what types of financing businesses should have access to. And, and to be clear, we're very supportive of, of over time, you know, kind of inclusive industry standards that, that encompass, you know, the range of products that we think small businesses should have access to. And that access should be fair, efficient, and, and transparent. So, so I think, you know, you'll see, I think the BBOR is an important step, you know, for a group of folks, um, but they kept that, that circle relatively small. And I think you'll see a number of the other players, you know, such as on deck, such as some others I'm familiar with, putting together, you know, their own thoughts about how the industry should evolve. And I'm, I'm confident you know, in a year or two, you'll see kind of a reconciliation between the different uh, pieces of the puzzle here, because I think everyone sort of wants the same thing ultimately, which is a, as a transparent and fair marketplace. Yeah. And we also want a, we want a common voice if we are, if this does, does sort of evolve into an industry association. I mean, we feel like we, we want to have, we want that to be uh, an all-inclusive thing as well. But, exactly. Yeah. Anyway, I want to switch gears over to the uh, investing side or the market, the other side of your mm -hmm. marketplace. You know, it, it seems like you're, you're at around like, you know, 35, 40% of your volume, at least in the mm -hmm. third quarter was done through your marketplace. So my first question is like, who, who are the participants? Who are you? Who are the investors now coming to on deck for you, you know, to invest in your marketplace? Sure. Yeah. We've, uh, we've really scaled up the marketplace program quite a bit over the last, uh, you know, 12 to 18 months now. I mean, as you noted, uh, you know, between 35 and 40% is the public guidance on, on the percentage of loans in the marketplace. Our gain on sale premiums have increased nicely as we've built more of a track record. And the investors are all institutional investors. So that's the first really important distinction about what OnDeck is doing versus what some of the other you know, platforms in the space have done. But it's a very big variety of institutions uh, within that group. So, You've got um, everything from you know banks and asset managers and hedge funds, business development corporations, uh, and 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 you know that really it's it's just a it's a broad spectrum. Some are very small, some are, are much larger, some are, are household names, and uh, and so what we've seen is that you know the platform we have a nice backlog of of institutional demand, and we've been sort of very methodically every uh, you know quarter adding some new investors to the platform and scaling up our production with the ones uh, who are already on. And so what, what are they, are they investing in all products, a range of products? What are, what are most, you know, what are investors choosing? Yeah, it's uh, so to be clear, the line of credit product is not yet available in the marketplace. It actually is kind of a more difficult product in some ways to fund in a marketplace right. structure because of the, sure. the draws and, and the, the sort of um, dynamic nature of those draws. Mm -hmm. But on the term loan side, I believe all of our products are now available in the marketplace. And what you see from investors really is is we do loan grading very similar to um, how you might see it on a, on a Prosper or Lending Club. So we band those loans together and we typically uh, will will fill the order for an investor every month. So an investor might say, I want, you know, 20% A loans, 20% B loans, 20% C, D, E. And then we would sort of pick a portfolio and we do that randomly with clear audit trails. So it's very uh, transparent about how that is done of, of those loans. And then we, uh, we will sell them to the investors. So, so it is, it's a little bit different than, than some models where investors are picking individual loans or re-underwriting. I mean, it really is more based on the overall loan grade, overall profile. And then you get a pool of loans that, uh, that you know, perform at a certain level based on the risk level you've chosen. Right. And so you said you've got, it sounds like you've got a, a well and truly a full, a full marketplace, uh, participants as, you know, I guess my question is, are you taking on new investors as well right now? 
Uh, yes, we are. And uh, we have a, a nice pipeline of, of investors kind of waiting to, to get onto the platform. So I think, you know, these are very attractive assets. They're shorter term in general than, than traditional kind of small business loans. They're relatively higher yield. Uh, they're self-liquidating. You have frequent payments. So we can provide really dynamic reporting either on a daily or weekly basis for loans uh, to these investors. So yeah, no, the investor demand is strong and you know, we anticipate that uh, to continue. Okay. So I want to switch gears to international. You know, you're you in Canada, uh, I think, I don't know how long it's been, almost a year, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, a little bit longer. Yep. A little bit longer. Okay. So, and then you've just recently announced your Australian operation, which I'm personally very, very pleased with. <laughs> so uh, are we. So are we. <laughs> um, so where, where are you at? Can you just give us an update on both, both those countries? Sure. Yeah. Happy to. So, so Canada actually has been about 18 months for us and, and is proceeding very, very well. Um, so we've seen substantial growth in that business over the last year, as you'd expect, obviously, from a relatively uh, you know, slow start. But what I find particularly interesting is if you overlay the Canada growth on our original growth in the U.S., we're doing a lot better in Canada. And, and so what that shows is that some of the lessons of building this business here are eminently transportable. I mean, even if you know, the payment system is different or the data sources are a little bit different, you know, our, our you know, hypothesis here is that a restaurant in the U.S. Is, is, is similar to a restaurant in Canada, at least similar enough that you can market to that restaurant in a similar way. I and mean, you can underwrite and, and, and service and sell uh, that restaurant in a very similar way. Um, so no, very pleased there. We hired a gentleman named Gary uh, Fernall uh, over um, the last couple months months to come in and be our country manager uh, in Canada. So he's based up in Toronto and we're building out a small team around him. And the nice thing, obviously, about Canada is we've staffed a lot of that right from our operations here in the U.S. So it's been very cost effective, I think, in terms of, you know, kind of our investment to uh, return. Um, If you pivot over to Australia, that is not close to the U.S. last time I checked. (laughs) And so we're very excited about our Australia business. You know, it's obviously much further away uh, from the U.S. And if you look at at, at why we went to Australia next after Canada, because it wasn't actually such a close country. The thinking there was we had about seven different teams from Australia reach out to us about building the on-deck business over there uh, in Australia. And one of those teams in particular involved this company called MYOB. MYOB is the largest accounting software company in Australia. And we thought that that just presented an amazing opportunity to get our business off the ground over there based on the success we've had here in the US uh, with Intuit. So we announced the relationship in April of last year. We said we would be live by, uh, by the end of of, uh, 2015 and on schedule, on budget, we got that business live uh, at the end of November. I mean, actually, we're very pleased so far with how it's uh, come together. Um, I should also mention that not only do we have a partnership with MYOB, we announced in December a partnership with the CBA, which is the largest bank in Australia. So I think what's really interesting is that if you look at our U.S. business, it took us kind of eight years to build a marquee relationship with Intuit and a relationship, you know, with J.P. Morgan, the largest bank. Um, if you look at Australia, really without having made a single loan, we built a relationship with MYOB. OB and, and CBA, so the largest accounting software company and the largest bank. And that we think is indicative of, of the track record we've built up and makes us very optimistic for how we can grow the business uh, over there. Yeah, that, that's very impressive. I mean, and I think, I mean, CBA, I mean, Co- the Commonwealth Bank CBA is, they are a, a very large bank. I mean, Australia's four largest banks are control. You know, ninety plus percent of the market, and they're exactly. much, much larger, comparatively speaking, to the size of the of the industry than in the U.S. So that's that's a that's a huge a huge win for you guys, uh, I think. And I'm I'm pleased that uh, that you have decided it's not too far to go to set up a business. It's a little bit further <laughs> from New York, you know. You need to you need to right you need to exactly. California. It's a straight shot, but uh, <laughs> from New York, you've got uh, you've got to get to the West Coast first. Yes, no, I'm heading over there uh, in a couple months, and um, no, I'm, I'm going to have to download a lot of uh, TV shows to watch on the plane or something. It's going to be a long trip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you get used to it. I've, d- I've done that. Uh, I've done the flight over the Pacific a hundred plus times. Oh my gosh! And uh, you get used to it. It's not. Uh, it's not that bad. Not that now, bad. I, right, I like it now because it's you know it's fourteen hours to yourself. You don't have to. You know, no, no one can bother you. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, so. Another question, you, you know, you've talked about a, a full suite of loan products, which you pretty much have. What you don't have is an SBA-backed loan. Mm-hmm. And this is just something that I've, I've been personally curious about for a while. I mean, like the, the banks have had a stranglehold or a monopoly virtually on mm-hmm. SBA-backed loans. Are, we, are you talking to the SBA? Are we ever going to see on deck have an SBA-backed loan? 
You know, I can't speak to our exact future product plans, but I think it's a very intriguing idea. So we've obviously, you know, watched the SBA program for years. You know, the, the SBA program has a huge amount of, I would say, brand awareness uh, with, with small business owners. But if you look at the way On Deck has built its business, you know, we really haven't been subsidized at all. We've had no government subsidies for the loans that, that we make, which, which gives us, I think, on the plus side, some independence. On the negative side, it means we have to absorb all of our component costs directly. And, and ultimately, uh, you know, that gets reflected in our pricing. So, so, you know, we're definitely intrigued by the idea of an SBA loan. You know, our first priority probably in the near term is to, is to build a um, comprehensive, unsubsidized, if you will, a solution and toolkit for small business owners. But uh, no, it's definitely something we, we, we are intrigued by. Um, there's a really interesting company called Live Oak. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they're um, you know, publicly traded. They're the number two, I think, SBA lender now in the country. They've built their entire business from scratch on SBA loans to very specific small business verticals. So we think they're up to some interesting stuff over there. And, and I think you know a lot of our technology around improving the lending process could be um, applied to the SBA loan process because actually that's the slowest process we believe out there, at least on average, that right. we hear about from small business owners. So I think a huge process opportunity there. Um, there are only, I believe, 13 non-bank SBA licenses out there. So those are controlled by a number of different companies. And so uh, you know we'll take a look at it over time uh, for sure. But on the, on the meantime, I think what you've seen with us is our, our you know again, the, the length of our loans has been extending. The size has been extending as well. So we should be very competitive even if we don't have an SBA product on the shelf uh, anytime soon. Right, right. Okay. Okay. I, got, I know we're just about out of time, but I want to ask you one last question. I mean, you have a, a pretty unique view of, of the economy and particularly the, as, as it pertains to small businesses. And, you know, we've, you know, as we're recording this, the, you know, the market, the stock market mm-hmm. is not doing very well. And people are saying, is this, are we going to see a, a recession coming up here later this year? I mean, I guess I'd like to get your perspective, just given that the, you know, the, the data that you see, are small businesses starting to struggle? Have you seen anything as far as that would be a, a, a forward indicator that we are going to have some economic d- difficult times ahead? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, particularly in light of what's going on, you know, overseas, some of the drama, you know, out of China in the last few weeks, some of the drama around energy prices, clearly what's going on in the public markets. I mean, you know, from our vantage point, the U.S. economy remains uh, strong. And uh, maybe not gangbusters strong. I mean, I don't think anyone's going to see like massive GDP growth, you know, anytime soon. But we're not seeing the economy contract either. So, uh, you know, small business confidence went up a little bit in December. Um, it's been trending up steadily for the last, you know, five years or so. But if you put that in perspective, you look at that confidence level in December. It's still lower than uh, it was back in 1986. It's lower than it was pre-credit crisis. So, you know, I think plotting along is probably too negative. But uh, but certainly it's not. A rocket ship of growth in the U.S. Um, and if you look at our own uh, delinquency statistics, you know I, I think our Q3 write-offs were down from the Q2 write-offs number. So even you know by that metric, and and even some of our leading indicators, you look at our provision rate, which is our expectation of loan defaults in the future. I mean you know, that was trending very very well below our six to seven percent target in the third quarter as well. So no, I think our our you know read on things is definitely more in the center than in the sort of negative territory. Um, and if if anything on the center, it's towards towards positive territory, not negative. Um, but we'll, we'll keep an eye out for sure. I mean, we've seen our data in the past be a very strong leading indicator of, you know, other stuff going on in the economy. And so uh, we definitely watch it every day. Okay. Well, that's good news. And anyway, I, I need to let you go. I really appreciate you coming on the show today, Noah. Thanks so much, Peter. Okay. See ya. Take care. Bye. Well, that is good news indeed that Noah's not seeing anything on in his data that would suggest that we're about to head into a recession. But the reality is it is going to happen at some point. And as an industry, we're going to have to deal with it. One of the big hits on the industry that many people have is that we haven't been through a full credit cycle. And so we're not... Yeah, you know, we're not all that tested in a downturn. Now, I personally think that uh, the underwriting at most companies is quite robust, and we are really preparing for a, a, a another recession. And yeah, you know, sure, defaults will go up, but I think you know, with good underwriting, we you can really mitigate some of the downside there. And yeah, you know, we will see. Hopefully, actually, not anytime soon. And if uh, if Noah's right, we may be we may not be about to head into a recession, but we certainly are overdue. And it will happen one of these days and the industry will, uh, will I think have its uh, moment of truth in some ways. If we can come through that well, then I think you're going to see a lot of investors who have been on the sidelines for a long time jump back in. Anyway, on that note, I would like just to say thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it and uh, we will catch you next time. Bye. 